Welcome back to Black News Tonight. We continue our discussion around racial inequities surrounding media. Now we expand our conversation to take a historical look. The new book, Journalism and Jim Crow, describes the years after the Civil War when white newspapers in the South helped build white supremacist social orders using the tools of racial terror. The authors go on to detail how black journalists fight back, demanding that the United States live up to its founding democratic ideals. With me to discuss the book is the co-editor, Kathy Roberts Ford. She is also professor of journalism at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Uh, welcome to Black News Tonight. I'm also joined uh, by one of the book's contributors. Uh, in fact, let me start with one of the contributors, DeWeston. Uh, draw me a picture of uh, the New South after the Civil War. Right. Uh, great question. Thank you so much for having us. So the New South after the Civil War was really um, uh, a moment in state building that was dedicated to a New South using old tools. Right, very um, um, durable tools that had been so essential to slavery that would now become even more essential in this new project of state building called Reconstruction. And so what we find is that the New South was uh, this marketing tool or promotional strategy for masking um, the oppression of Black folk. That included uh, the suppression of Black voters, uh, the control of Black mobility and Black autonomy, um, Black political aspirations, um, Black land ownership. And um, it was uh, this moment when Black journalists uh, decided to resist, that they found that uh, one of the central arms of this new state of white supremacy in the Jim Crow South, uh, in the New South, was uh, the white press. So Black journalists resisted. They fought back. Uh, so uh, Ida B. Wells, T. Thomas Fortune, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, among others, um, used uh, the press to fight back against uh, what the New South was attempting to do, which was to mask black, uh, black resistance and black demands for racial equality. Uh, Kathy, let me bring you into the conversation as one of the co-editors here, uh, because I know you have a tremendous insight of this kind of historical perspective and this, this scope. Uh, what were the role of white newspapers in building this new South? They were absolutely essential. Uh, so in the South uh, post reconstruction, what we have is newspaper editors who, white newspaper editors who were joining forces with business leaders, political leaders, and the Democratic Party, which was then the party of white supremacy. And post-Reconstruction, what they were involved with was figuring out how to rebuild a racial hierarchy in the South. And in building that racial hierarchy, they were interested in pulling back power from um, black and white Republicans who were cooperating with one another during Reconstruction. They were interested in um, over time in the 1880s and 1890s in uh, quashing black economic power and political power by disenfranchising black voters. And they did a lot of this work collectively as a political business and press block and as part of Democratic Party campaigns. And uh, they were not shy or afraid to use racial terror as a tool. Wow, that's terrifying, but absolutely accurate. Uh, DeWesson, let me also obviously talk about black journalists, uh, because what I want to understand better is what their reaction was to what was happening in that, in that historical moment. Right, so uh, one of the promotional tools of the New South was this term New South, and there were a number of uh, white journalists and editors who were using this term freely to describe what was happening, right? So the black press, again, these, these people I've named, Ida B. Wells, W.E.B. Du Bois, among others, who said, you know, we're, we're not interested in the new South, we're interested in, in a new America. Uh, why are we committing ourselves to rebuilding things as they were when we could build something entirely new, right? Um, and, and so one thing that the, the book does uh, that is fantastic, right, that um, 
it, it reveals journalism as, as a, a body of knowledge and as a professional practice that was steeped in um, you know, pri providing a framework for white supremacy. And so black journalists work to call white journalists out on the carpet, right? To call them out and say what exactly it was that they were doing precisely, that they were invested in uh, rebuilding things as they were, as Kathy mentioned, these racial hierarchies that had helped sustain slavery, which would become instrumental to this new moment of state building in the New South. Uh, so you have Black journalists who were putting their lives on the line, literally, uh, to, to make these, these claims to expose white supremacy for what it was. And they were doing it in the aims of creating a new America, a truly democratic state. I mean, that, that's fascinating, right? Because I think sometimes the general public will think about media, journalism, uh, et cetera, as sort of neutral spaces or objective spaces w that simply are um, there to document politics, document history, document state projects, as opposed to playing a role in the formation of these various state projects or being arms or apparatuses of the state itself. Uh, Kathy, it's not that that stuff is only happening in the past, though. Uh, Right-wing media uh, has attempted to overturn the results of a secure and fair election just two years ago. Uh, it's very much an old play from an old playbook. Uh, and you describe that play in detail. Can you help us understand what that play and playbook is? Absolutely. That's so well said. Uh, so let's think of 1875 in Mississippi. There is a white editor by the name of Ethelbert Barksdale of the Jackson Clarion, the most powerful, influential white newspaper in the state of Mississippi at that time. And this is, of course, toward the end of Reconstruction. And Ethelbert Barksdale is also a key leader in the Democratic Party. And so he and his Democratic cronies um, took up a plan to wrest power from the Republican Party, which is, of course, uh, the party of Lincoln. And in order to take back power, they devise uh, what's called the Mississippi Plan of 1875. And it's essentially a plan of racial terror and voter intimidation and um, an effort to steal the upcoming election so that the Democrats can take power back in the state of Mississippi and erect white supremacy, which is exactly what they do. And uh, they use the Jackson Clarion, that newspaper, not only to organize and spread uh, this plan, but also to organize the white paramilitaries that do the, the work of racial terror um, and help um, bring about the Clinton massacre and um, a, a reign of bloody terror for black Mississippians that lasted for quite a while. So this is um, also a playbook that was used in North Carolina in the election of 1898. In North Carolina, it was Josephus Daniels of the Raleigh News and Observer. And he, again, was part of the Democratic Party, again, then the party of white supremacy. And they uh, concocted a Democratic Party campaign to drive a wedge between white populist and black Republicans who had created the fusionist movement, which was a biracial political movement in the state of North Carolina. They held the legislature, they held the governorship, they um, held power in Wilmington, North Carolina, which was at the time the largest city in North Carolina. It was majority black. It had a thriving black middle class. It was the city on a hill, the shining star in the South for um, black Southerners. And um, there, there was a daily black newspaper. I think the only one in the country at the time led by Alexander Manley. And, uh, what you have happen is not only uh, widespread violence and intimidation against black voters, you also have uh, racist political cartoons in the Rolling News and Observer demonizing black men as um, sexual assaulters of white women. You have Alexander Manley, the Daily Record, the black paper in Wilmington fighting back against those racist tropes and against the violence. And uh, what happens, of course, is the Democrats steal the election and they execute a coup in Wilmington, and they kill between 30 and 300 black Wilmingtonians, and Alexander Manley has to leave. 
and they burn his press. Wow. And so they burn the organizing mechanism for Black North Carolina. And then they disenfranchise wow. it's, it's stunning. Black voters. It, and that and th and that's the point right there. I mean, it's it's, just, it's fascinating to see uh, just how different, but also sadly how similar these narratives are. Uh, the details change, but the systems and structures uh, seem to be not very different. And that's why this book is so uh, important. Uh, Kathy, thank you so much to Wes, and thank you for your brilliant uh, historical insights as well.